but we'll be in 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. You can open up your Bibles or your devices there. And I will actually start our time uh, by reading the, script, the passage for us. So there John writes, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. For he did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, in the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made God out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. This is the word of the Lord. Bertrand Russell, he was a name that was a well-known name, was a well-known atheist philosopher who wrote more than 100 books. He actually won the Nobel uh, Prize for Literature back in 1950. One of his best-known books is entitled Why I Am Not a Christian. He wrote that back 100 years ago, basically, in 1927. And his arguments against Christianity usually centered around it being a supposed remnant of a barbaric era. In fact, his, his argument against not only Christianity, but all organized religion was that organized religion is a hypocritical set of superstitions that have no basis or use in reality. This morning, as we begin, as we read here First John, I want to drill down, though, on one of Russell's more famous quotes when he was asked what he would ask God if he ever were standing before God. What would, what would he ask the God of the universe? To which Russell responded with, and I quote, I would probably ask, Sir, why did you not give me better evidence? And of course, better evidence, I use air quotes around that, is referring to the evidence of God's existence and that God really did what the Bible, what his word claims that he did. And so as we begin this morning, I pose the question, does Russell and many others like him, do they have a point? Do we really need better evidence? Should we be seeking even more evidence than what God has given us? Is the evidence that God has given us insufficient in any way? Of course, the Apostle John would firmly and fully deny and argue against any lack of belief in Jesus being because of lack of, of sufficient evidence. And one of the clearest, one of God's clearest rebuttals to any accusation that he has left us with inferior evidence is, is right in what we just read, 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. What we have here is actually God's testimony about his son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done in his son, Jesus Christ. And what we will see here is that believers, we have truly absolute assurance that Jesus is who he says that he is, that Jesus has done what he says that he has done, certainly that he has existed. And what we have here is that believers, that through Christ, we have absolute assurance where we left off last week, absolute assurance that Jesus is not only eternal life, but he is also abundant life. That God, for, for Russell and for any who would doubt or question, that God has left us with abundant, overflowing evidence to the truth of this fact. Not only his testimony, but today we see he's left us with the testimonies of others. And as we begin to think about this, the testimonies of, of what God has done, we think about the status or the bar, if you will, of testimonies about anything of any importance. The standard that it takes to prove something to be true throughout history, and especially places like the court of law, you know, in trials for things as serious as murder. What has been the standard throughout history? Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6 captures this. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person is to be put to death, but no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. And that rule, that that status, that, that bar over whether or not someone is convicted of a crime or not has, has stood the test of time. It is still the status that we have to this day. And I think we, we understand this God's law code. It sets in place that a person shall not be put to death unless there were at least two or three people that are corroborating that this person has done something worthy 
of being put to death. And God's law, if you read into the verse 7, I don't have it on the screen, God's law actually says that, that to be convicted of death, the person that, that are testifying against you have to be the first to, to put their hand into the pile of rocks and throw the first stone to con convict the person, to put the person to death. And the reason that that is true is because if you're not willing to put your hand in and put the person to death, maybe, maybe they didn't really do what they are accused of doing. And so there is a standard that God has put into place that proof is not proof, that truth is not truth until you have at least two or three witnesses bearing testimony that, that this is, in fact, reality. And that's really the backstory that John writes verses 6 to 8 to us with in mind. Three witnesses have to bear the same testimony about the same subject for it to be determined fact. And here the testimony is Jesus Christ is God's son. Jesus Christ is God's sacrifice for our sins and thus the only path to eternal life. And we see these three witnesses as we'll look through them. They escalate in authority as we move along. John's first testimony that he writes about is that Jesus is God's son. And he begins that by proving that by saying that Jesus is God's son because he has come about by water. What in the world does that matter? What do we learn there? What is meant at the declaration that Jesus has come by water? Well, we can think to a couple different places in Jesus' ministry to understand that. We can think all the way back to the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. In fact, before his public ministry has actually begun, what was Jesus' first public act, his first miracle? So all the way back in John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding in a place called Cana. He takes something that existed in the world, something in water that is totally ordinary as you can get, and he turned it into something extraordinary. You can remember the situation, read about it in John 2. Jesus is at a wedding in Cana. He's there just as a wedding guest, and a major social faux pas happens. They run out of wine at the wedding reception, and Mary's mother, uh, Jesus' mother Mary, must have had a place of authority at the wedding because she's all upset about this. She seeks Jesus' help in this. She's, she's not necessarily expecting Jesus to perform a miracle. Jesus hasn't performed a miracle yet, but Mary comes to Jesus because Jesus himself has proven himself to, to be someone that she can trust even in the hardest times of moments in life. And Mary comes to Jesus with her problem. Jesus says, do this, gives her instructions of what to do amidst her problem. Mary is obedient, and the next thing you know, Jesus, without ever leaving his seat, has turned what has had the guest asking what has happened. Right, the guest start drinking the wine, and they're asking, how has this amazing wine come about? Why are we drinking the best, this amazing wine now, towards the end of the party? Because it was custom to have the best wine first when everyone had their full senses available to them and bring out the, the cheaper wine at the end when everyone had their, their senses dulled through their drunkenness. But this is, wine is so good that it cut through the people's drunkenness and it caused everyone to, that drank it to ask, what has happened? How has something so ordinary become so extraordinary? And Jesus came to take ordinary things, ordinary vessels like those ordinary water jars that he turned into extraordinary wine jars. Jesus has come taking ordinary vessels and he's been doing extraordinary things with them, turning them into something truly out of this world. We know that Jesus had the power of God to take ordinary things, make them extraordinary like he did with the water in Cana. We know that Jesus took things, uh, those few meager bread and fish by the water, and he multiplied them beyond measures that we could ever ask or imagine. He took things that were insufficient and he made them totally and wholly sufficient. He, he multiplied them. And when we think of Jesus coming by water and the testimony that water bears to the truth of who Jesus is, we have to think of his baptism as well. His baptism where Jesus did officially begin his earthly ministry. And he began his earthly ministry by identifying with those whom he came to minister to. Let's think about baptism. What is baptism for us, for every human being not named Jesus? Baptism is a public witness to an already realized inward reality. Baptism, the act itself, has never and will never save anyone. 
It's always what we just sang about. It's God's grace and our faith that does that. But what baptism is, is a declaration that I have placed my trust in Jesus, my faith in him, and thus I have been made new by him. A public declaration that I have gone into the water, simplifying the, the presence of Christ that we've gone in, that we have been washed by him, had him take our sins away from us as far as the east is from the west, and we've come out of the waters clean, redeemed, and made new. And that now we're declaring that we are going to use the rest of our lives seeking to know Jesus better so that we can follow him better. Right? That's what baptism is for each and every one of us, that we are cleansed of our sins by our faith in Jesus Christ. What was baptism, though, for Jesus? We know that Jesus was, well, he never sinned, so he certainly did not need to, need to be cleansed of his sins. Rather, Jesus was baptized for two headline reasons, and they both have to do with identity and identification. First, it was to identify with us sinners. Jesus went into baptism as a went into the waters of baptism as a public step one, if you will, to testify for all to see that he is going to identify with us sinners in a way that only God himself could imagine. That God himself is going to be the one to bear the testimony, to pay the consequences for sin, the thing that makes baptism needed as a thing in the first place. Remember, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and Jesus' baptism, we see Jesus bear testimony to the fact that he truly is the Lamb of God, as John testified. He truly is the Lamb of God sent into the world to save the world from its sin. And then amidst his baptism, as if all that wasn't enough, God the Father, God's booming voice, thunders from the clouds at the moment of Jesus' baptism, saying that this is Jesus, identifying that this is my Son, and he is the one whom I will please. We must understand that this declaration by God confirms the important truth about who Jesus is. He is God's son. I mean, God says that very clearly. I don't need to expand upon that. But it also declares that, that he is God's son. He is his son without any sin. Right? God is well pleased with Jesus before he does any ministry, before he does any miracle, before he ever hangs from a cross or, or rises from the grave. Jesus has already pleased his heavenly father. Jesus was baptized with water. What it means that Jesus came by water means that he came clearly identified as the Son of Man, as that Lamb of God that takes away the sins of humanity. And also so that we, humankind, can identify, clearly identify him as the Son of God. We don't have God the Father verbally speaking too often in the New Testament, but two of the times that we do, here at Jesus' baptism and later at Jesus' transfiguration, he says the exact same thing. He points to Jesus and says, this is my son. In him, he is the one I am well pleased. Of course, the thundering voice of God got Peter's attention on the Mount of Transfiguration. These memories stuck with John as he pens them to paper here in about A.D. 100. As we have said before in this series, John wants us to understand in this letter the reality of Jesus' incarnation, of who Christ is, that he is 100% man, fully identified with all that it means to be human, all the same trials, temptations, weaknesses that we face, he faced, right? The only thing that Jesus did not participate in of the human experience is sin. And simultaneously, he is 100% God. He has always been. He always will be. He's 100% divine all the time. Not that a unique divine power came on him at his baptism or that he appeared to be flesh but was actually spirit or that his divinity somehow left him when he went upon the cross as the Gnostic heretics of John's day and as the heretics of our days will try to twist and say. But that a, from A to Z of Jesus... From A to Z of Jesus' incarnation, he was 100% God and 100% man. So when we read that Jesus came by water and what truth and proof that, he, that his coming by water entails, think of every point from beginning to end of Jesus' incarnation. His first proof that he is God made flesh. 
God made flesh with the power of God to take ordinary things and do extraordinary things with them at a place like a wedding in Cana. You know, his baptism in Jordan waters where he identified with sinners, where his heavenly father identified for us him as his own son. Think of Jesus' waters as he traversed his testimony that he is God's perfect son. And then what about this second testimony? What about the testimony of the blood? What about the second thing that John declares that Jesus came by? When John writes that Jesus came by water and blood, he is literally writing, and you can take note of this, you can examine the evidence of who Jesus is, the testimony that there are endless sources, again, from A to Z, birth to the cross of, of who Jesus is. And we can think, where is blood most prominently a part of Jesus' life and ministry? It's, of course, at the cross. So from Jesus' water baptism forward, we know that Jesus is God's perfect son, but at the cross, we have blatant and clear testimony and witness that Jesus is God's perfect sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice that takes away all of our sins. And we can think about where we were a few months ago in the lead into Easter when we zoomed into those final 24 hours of Jesus' life and, and Jesus' final conversation in John's gospel with a king named Pilate. Remember that at the end of John chapter 18, Jesus has been arrested and wrongly convicted by the Jewish authorities. The Jewish authorities, they hand him over to a king named Pilate, a Roman king, to be crucified. And remember, Pilate doesn't really want anything to do with what's before him. He doesn't want anything to do with this Jewish uh, controversy or Jesus, so he's looking for any way to get out of it. Actually, I think he's just trying to figure out what it is that the Jews have, have pulled him into the whole time. And Pilate is asking over and over again the same question. Who are you? Why is it they want you to kill? Are you a king? And if you are the king of the Jews, why do the Jews themselves want you to be killed? Remember, Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate says, you are a king then. And Jesus answers him, you say that I am a king? In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And then what was Pilate's famous, infamous response? He just has just said what he has said through his words and his actions already countless times before through his life and ministry. Same thing he said in, in Cana, the same thing he said at his baptism, that he is God's son, the true king, the king of kings, and his kingdom is outside of this world. That there's more than enough evidence that Jesus is not just a king, but he is the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But how did Pilate and, and Russell and countless others from the lost generations of humanity, how have so many others responded to the mounds of evidence that Jesus is who he says that he is and he's done what he has claimed to have done? Pilate says, what is truth? Pilate from here does everything he can to weasel his way out of facing the truth of who Jesus is. Out of actually being confronted by Jesus and the truth of, of who he is. He keeps questioning, he keeps questioning, keeps looking for, for, uh, for an exception, a hole in the armor, so to speak, so he doesn't have to be confronted with, with actual truth. And Jesus, in his wisdom, he knows that at this point that he said enough for Pilate or for anyone else who have eyes that actually want to see the truth of who he is, that they could see the truth. So he mostly goes silent. Pilate just keeps questioning Jesus until he finally blurts out, don't you understand that I have the power, that I have the power to either set you free or have you crucified? And at that, Jesus does speak up, and he says, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Now, in this moment, and in the three days of moments that, that followed, it appeared that Pilate was the one in ultimate power. We know that he does finally sentence Jesus to death. Jesus dies upon a cross. He is placed in the grave. Pilate goes back to, to ruling over his, his kingdom. But we know that neither stayed where they are, right? Pilate is, is now nothing but a, a figure of history. He's, he's no longer a ruler of anything. And we know now that Jesus did not stay in the grave. He did not stay 
dead. And he's ruler over all. Instead, he arose from the grave and he has shined the light and the truth of, of who he is for, for all to see. Jesus is bloodshed, the sacrifice on the cross. It is the sacrifice. It is the ransom that pays our debt to sin and satisfies the righteous judgment of God. The testimonies that, that Jesus' death is no ordinary death are not only witness in the fact that he, he defeated death and rose from the grave, but it's, it's actually witness in his act of dying. We know that as Jesus dies, the, the temple veil is, is split in half from top to bottom. We know the ground shakes, and, and we're told that the saints of God, the tombs of the saints of God are actually opened, and, and godly men and women are, are actually rose, rise to life uh, as well, and, and as a precursor of what God is in the midst of doing. We know that darkness comes over the land when, when light should have been on the clock. Right? All the events, all the testimony that God gives for all to see, if anyone could see it, if they just had eyes to see, at Jesus' death, it was enough to make one Roman guard who was actively participating in crucifying Jesus say, surely this man is who he says he was. Surely this man was the Son of God. Clearly, what was going on around Jesus' death took an unbeliever to a believer, took him from unbelief, to believe. There was significant evidence at Jesus' death that Jesus, even in death, was God's son sent to save sinners. Remember what the Apostle Paul says about Jesus' resurrection in Romans 1 verse 4, that through the spirit of holiness, he was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. He is Jesus our Lord. Pilate, Russell, so many others have put themselves in the position of Lord. They trusted in their intellect, their understanding, their power as Lord over Jesus, themselves as the arbiters and holders of truth. But it is in Christ's death, ultimately in his resurrection, that says without a doubt, Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the Lord who has lived the perfect life that gives him authority over death. He's made the perfect sacrifice that pays the price for all of our sins. The water and the blood of Jesus, birth, the resurrection of Jesus, declare that he is Lord. God's perfect son and sacrifice. That's testimony one and two, but let's not forget about testimony number three, witness number three. One that Paul mentions here and that, that John mentions in verses six through, well, six through eight as well. And that is the testimony of the Holy Spirit. As we think about the water and the blood those are things, those are events that have taken place in the, event, in the past. They are events, actual historical events, but, but they've happened for us over 2,000 years ago. How can we, living generations after they've take place, taken place, how can we have absolute assurance that they are true? Well, the answer to that question is through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that ever-present witness in our lives and world telling us, pointing us to the truth of Jesus. For believers, he is working in us, and the work he is doing is affirming the truth of Jesus that we already hold. At the moment of our, of our profession of faith, he enters our lives. He literally indwells our lives and works and moves in our lives, confirming the truth of Jesus in our hearts. He does that through our actions, through our words, through our attitudes. He, in the deepest parts of our souls, the Holy Spirit is working and the work he is doing is pointing us to the affirmation of Christ. But he's also working in non-believers as well. He's not indwelling their lives yet, but he is working in their lives. It is the Holy Spirit who is constantly working to penetrate those scales that sin and pride put over our eyes that keep us from seeing the clear truth of Jesus of who he is and what he has done. The Holy Spirit is there with, with chisel and axe, chiseling away at hard hearts, and it is only by the Holy Spirit that we are able to see the truth of Jesus and, and turn to him in faith. He is ever-present, always active in our lives and world. And the work that he is doing in a believer or a non-believer is pointing us to the work that Christ has done, the completed work of Christ. The Holy Spirit is our link to what Christ has done and who Christ is. He is our eyes to see what Christ did over 2,000 years after he did them. 
just as the Holy Spirit. We often talk about the Holy Spirit as, as pointing us to the future and what Christ is doing and what will do. He, he does that. But he is our eyes to see and, and believe what Jesus has done. Now John reminds us in verse number 9 that, that we are readily uh, excited and, and happy, happy to every day accept the testimony of, of humans, of our fellow man. Right? Every day on, on our way to, to church this morning, we accepted human testimony that the bridges that we drove over weren't going to collapse and they're safe to drive on. We, right now in this moment, we accept that the electric that courses through this building is not going to burn the building down with us in it. Right? Later when we go to lunch, we accept that the food that we are going to eat is not going to make us sick or, or ultimately kill us. Right? We accept human testimony all the time. And with all that we have spoken about this morning and, and so much more testimony that I didn't have time to talk about, how can we accept human testimony so readily but not God's testimony? Like that's John's point. We have more than enough evidence, more than enough testimony to have belief in Jesus Christ. In fact, it's the very testimony of God himself. Now, I want to close our time as, as John does in verses 10 through 12, talking about the results of our belief in Jesus and the truth of who he is. As I mentioned earlier, the, the big idea is that we have absolute assurance that Jesus is abundant life. As we did last week, we should, we should think about when we think about eternal life is not only when we get to heaven, although that is a reality of it, we should also think of of the John 10, 10 reality, that Jesus says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come. I have come now that you may have life and have it to the full, right? Life that doesn't only begin one day when we get to heaven, but we may have life to the full today. John, I believe, is expanding here on what that actually means. First, he wants us to see, he wants us to understand that, that we have eternal life. That by our belief in Jesus, we don't have to guess at eternity. We don't have to wonder at where or with who we shall spend our afterlife with. As you and as many of you know, Julie and I attended her, her grandmother's funeral a few weeks ago, and it was a Catholic service. And the priest's sermon at the funeral was basically six different examples showing that you never know when you're going to die. And so we should do good things and hope that the good things that we do are enough to be accepted by God and thus he'll, he'll get us into heaven. Right? He even gave an example of him ministering to a woman on her deathbed, knowing and saying that he didn't have any hope to give her because she was dying. So how could she do any good work? Friends, in that moment, I was never more thankful for the truth of the gospel and of Jesus Christ. That regardless of how many and how good our works are, that regardless of what we do or who we are, that the work that gets us into heaven is, is not completed by our hands, that it's already been completed, that we are awarded eternity despite our good works and only because of Christ's completed work. That when we confess Jesus Christ as Lord with our mouths and, and our lives declare him to be our Savior and Lord, we don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder or not, whether or not we have eternal life. Rather, by grace and through faith, we can and we do know that eternal life is ours. But John's letter is intimidating to read, even for Christians. It's sometimes even ignored for Christians because John speaks in absolutes. Think about what he writes here. He says, let me skip ahead one more. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is, is in his son. John is, is clear. He is short, simple, and turned to the point. He says eternal life is in Jesus. Here he says, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Short, simple, and to the point. Either you have Jesus, you have the Son, and you have life, or you're rejecting the Son, and thus you are without eternal life. There is no gray area. There's no room to wonder. There's no room to hope as the world hopes. There's no room to guess. There's certainly no room for, for conjecture or to demand more evidence. We know that if Jesus is our Lord, then heaven is our destination. 
then eternal life is our possession. It is ours. That if we have faith in the Lord, eternal life with Jesus in heaven is, is our prize. We know this. We have full and complete possession of this truth. John says there's, there's more than enough evidence to believe this and have this type of faith. And it is that I want to, with that, I want to try to tie this message and its witness to the truth of Jesus together with a bow so we can take it home with us, hold on to it, write it on paper, but, but most importantly, live it out in our lives. First, understand that indifference towards Jesus is impossible. You can truly, you cannot truly see who Jesus is, see what Jesus has done, and shrug your shoulders and go back to life as usual. Again, either you are in the sun and obtain, you have eternal life today. Of course, as we often talk about, as we already talked about today, eternal life doesn't only start one day when we get to heaven, but it begins today. It allows us and it ushers us so that we can experience the eternal and abundant life of Christ today. It is the way that we can experience Jesus and his goodness and his good ways today. There are no such thing as, as half-hearted Christians, half-hearted followers of Jesus. You're either following Jesus or not. Jesus is either your Lord or he's not. John clearly lays this out in verse number 10. Let's hear these words once more. He says, whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God makes God out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. So we are either in submission and worship to God, we, you either believe God or, or you don't. Or as John puts it, you are literally making God himself, the God of the universe, out to be a liar. You are saying that you know more than the God of the universe or that the God of the universe has to prove himself to you. That what he has done may be enough evidence and has been enough evidence for countless individuals, but it's not enough for you. Right? It takes a, a large amount of arrogance and pride to, to demand more of the God who has given so much, who has given even his son, so that you might see, believe, and have eternal life through his son. Indifference towards Jesus is impossible. Indifference towards Jesus is rejection of Jesus and calling his father a liar. Second, and from this truth, we come back to the reality that I know I say often, but it's so true of our lives. Our, our behavior must match our belief. If Jesus is Lord, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, then the actions of your life should also confess Jesus is Lord. Right? The, the use of your money should confess Jesus is Lord. Then the use of your time should confess Jesus is Lord. Then the way that you interact with, with members that, uh, of your family and friends and your circle should confess Jesus is Lord. Just as the way that we interact with those that are outside our circles, those that act, think, and speak differently than us, those too should confess Jesus is Lord. The way that we are witnesses for Jesus must confess that Jesus is Lord and and like we believe that all those without Jesus, those without the Son of God, are thus without eternal life. If we really believe this to be true, that Jesus is, in fact, the one and only path to eternal life and salvation, then that will give us a, a holy eagerness and a holy boldness. A holy eagerness to share Christ and a holy boldness in our witness for Christ and the proclamation of his gospel. Our behaviors must match our belief. Our behaviors must match the one that we profess belief in. And then from that, our witness to Christ must not be withheld. I think the simplest depiction of what Jesus calls us to as his followers, how we are supposed to live our lives as his followers, is in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus says first that he will give us his power, that he will give us his power through the Holy Spirit, that when we profess faith in him, again, the Holy Spirit will come upon us. He will take up residence in our lives. And that when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives, through him, we will have the power in our lives that exists nowhere else, that we will have the power of the living God freely and fully available to us. And Jesus tells us that what the Spirit 
does is he empowers us to be his witnesses here, there, and everywhere, literally to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be the witnesses that the world can look to and know that there is a living God, that there is a God that is truly without match and without measure, a God, the God, who holds the keys to both eternal life and abundant life. So we should be witnesses to ourselves, witnesses personally in the deepest parts of ourselves. We should be witnesses to one another as believers. And we should be witnesses to yet to be believers that there is absolute assurance, absolute assurance that Jesus is abundant life, that he and he alone holds the keys to eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for the truth of your gospel, that we're not trusting in uh, any work of our hand, that that there's nothing that we can add to your salvation. There's nothing that we can distract from it. Yet you're only calling us to grace and through faith to receive what you have completed upon a cross, Lord. And so we celebrate today and we ask you to remind us what it is that you have done, Lord. What it is that you have laid down your life, lived the perfect life that we could never live, paid the price that, that we could never pay. And through your resurrection, you have made available to all who will look to you in faith and see you as their Savior. New and eternal life. New and eternal life that begins not today. Well, or begins today, but not someday. Lord, we also, as people that are living in that absolute assurance, Lord, I ask that you would wipe away any seeds of doubt or distrust that may be in our hearts, Lord. That that Holy Spirit that indwells in us would just work to chisel away any things that the enemy have tried to plant in our lives, Lord, that distract us and deter us from the truth of your Son, Lord. And Lord, that as you do that work, our witness would be more brilliant, it would be more perfect, it would be more illuminated and unfiltered to the world that is around us. That as in individuals and as Pequay Evangelical Church, we would be people of that good news through both word and that as we see, as the world sees us with, with hope that is not found anywhere else in this world, they would be drawn to us. They would wonder what it is that the hope that we have and that through our holy boldness and our eagerness to share the Son of God and his good news, Lord, that people would come to faith, that people would come to assurance of salvation that they would know that no matter what it is that comes, you hold the keys to life and death, and that when we, that when they go the way of the world, they will see next their Savior, their gracious Savior, saying, well done, good and faithful servant. So Lord, again, we pray that assurance is written on our hearts and that it is more brilliantly written on our hearts. The overflow of that will be seen to a wanting and a hurting. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Aren't you thankful for what he's done? Our sins are forgiven. Our future is heaven. And he is our living hope.